Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lord's house worship as we get ready for worship. Uh, a few announcements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regarding worship, um, we're using divided service setting three for the month of October. Yeah, we have Lord present uh, in, with and under the bread and wine, so we prepare our hearts and minds for those good gifts as we go to the rail today and uh, have a common cup available for you, if you prefer that. Um, I think that's, and we're going to have some special music in the service too, so uh, we're grateful for all those good things that happen uh, that cover uh, whether the sermon is good or not. So uh, we're blessed to be in God's house, so let's say, stand and greet one another for worship. Uh, so, as I travel the countryside. 
Uh, other uh, regular things happening, uh, Men's Bible Study Tuesday morning at 7, ladies at noon on Wednesdays, and uh, Wednesday afternoon, I'm in Spencer for confirmation and back here for confirmation as well. Mentor meeting this week, so confirmands, make sure you let your, your mentors know, and uh, it's a mentor only meeting, it'll be at 7.30 in the South Lounge after confirmation. They're, talk they're still not talking about us. Wow, that's rough. Uh, what else can I talk about? Uh, Beginning's Baby Bottle Fundraiser. That's another one that goes with the Life Sunday. Um, you can turn those back in uh, next Sunday. I know some of you already have done that. Uh, but again, that's helped support Beginning's... Uh, um, what's, what's, what's that proper term? Resource Center? Yeah, Beginning's Resource Center. Wendy Kelly is on, our, on the board over there, and we thank her for serving our congregation and our community that way. Uh, talking about us yet? Okay, they're talking about us. We're getting closer. So, can start no service before they let us on the air. Um, which means, are we already on the, um, Facebook? And we're already doing that. Okay, hi guys. Uh, those are on later live. So, <laughs> getting our attention to Connie? Okay. We're almost there. Three, two, one. It's like the old days. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lord's House Worship. We've been discussing and talking about life here inside the sanctuary at Christ Lutheran. We're glad to welcome those who are listening on KBRX. Thank you for joining us, as well as those who are watching on uh, YouTube and Facebook, too. We're glad we can stream that to you, and uh, we're grateful to be in God's house to receive good gifts today, uh, his body and blood in the sacrament, as well as to hear his word uh, preached and sung and uh, pray to him, so it's going to be a great day. Um, let us have a word of prayer to ask God to bless our worship. Dear God, Heavenly Father, each day is a gift from you. We cherish this day to spend time in your house, to be blessed by your word and sacrament. You are a truly good and gracious God, providing all that we need for this life and for eternal life. Uh, send your Holy Spirit to be in our midst, that we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number uh, six, 869, With the Lord Begin Your Task. We'll stand for the last verse. O come, let us worship the Lord.
We call upon our holy God and remember our baptisms as we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We read responsibly the intro for the day. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie on page 186. Father, 
Your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Testament for today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Then the Lord said, It's not good for that, that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God firmed it, formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to all the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read responsibly the gradual for the season. He will command his angels concerning you. To guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Our epistle comes to us from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by by the angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It, was, it has been testified somewhere, what is man, that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you care for him. You made him a little, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it is fitting that for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand for reading the Holy Gospel as we sing the triple hallelujah. Gospel 
gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. This will serve as the text for the sermon this morning. Pharisees came up and in order to test Jesus asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We make confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation, may we see it. This time we'll have special music by Carly Kopecki. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We're in a sermon. Uh, the next hymn that we sing together is Hymn 863, Our Father by Whose Name.
God's great mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the proclamation this morning is the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 10, uh, entitled, Just What Did He Say and Why Did He Say It? First, a few disclaimers. I could have picked a lot easier topic today than talking about divorce. Um, uh, for sure, I would have liked to have talked about the angels and in Hebrews there, uh, too, and how Jesus was made a little bit lower so he could take our place on the cross. But also to know that um, when I do my pre-marriage counseling, I inform the couple that my glue is not better than anybody else's glue. Now, occasionally it does work. Uh, last Saturday, uh, I drove through Gregory, South Dakota, and one of my first couples I married in South Dakota, she's been a Lutheran, or not a Lutheran, but a school teacher in Gregory for her whole career, She's still married to her husband, God willing, God bless her. But I also tell couples that by the grace of God and several good counselors, my wife and I would not be married today. That we need help. And, it was not, and I tell couples that too. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We all need help to be able to stay married. Now some of it's informal, uh, but uh, you know, my glue is not better than anybody else's. I married all three of my children, two of them are divorced. Um, we have siblings that are divorced. We have aunts and uncles that are divorced in our family. So this is not just in your kitchen. It's in my kitchen, okay, uh, for today. And there's a lot of different angles I could go at this topic in this sermon this morning. But uh, I want to focus on some of the history of what divorce is. That's part of the text, what Moses commanded and allowed for divorce, uh, as well as what was said afterwards uh, when he talked to the disciples, especially ending with children today, especially as we... Celebrate children with our elite preschool and, and uh, things that are happening there. But uh, I want to start out first with a story about a guy named C.S. Lewis. You've probably heard of him. Uh, he died over 60 years ago. He was born in Ireland and educated in England. He lost his mother at an early age. He served in World War I, turned to atheism for answers, spent his life in academia, and was ultimately as he put it in the title of his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. And his return to Christianity led to a stream of Christian books that continue to challenge and inspire and convert many skeptics uh, to this day. You may have read a, heard a few of them, like the Chronicles of Narnia, or uh, Screw Tape Letters is one of my favorite of his books. The one jarring note in this love story um, well, actually, go back uh, toward the end of the journey on his life. He met the love of his life, Joy Davidman. She was an American admirer who sought him out. And their love story was capped with her heroic struggle against cancer. And after her death in 1960, Lewis wrote one of his greatest works, just a slim volume titled, A Grief Observed, which was so personal that he published it under a pseudonym, a different name. And his friends, observing firsthand his struggles with grief, gave him copies of his own book, hoping it would provide him with comfort. The one jarring note in this love story was the struggle that Lewis and Davidman had in getting married during the latter's battle with cancer. David, you see, was a divorcee. And many a clergy, some of them Lewis's close personal friends, refused to perform the marriage ceremony because of Jesus' words regarding, regarding divorce and remarriage. At last, however, the couple found a sympathetic clergyman, and the two were married before Joy's death. Perhaps no words by Jesus have been interpreted so literally and so misinterpreted so painfully. Women who flee brutal domestic violence are nevertheless told they cannot remarry and must remain single parents, necessitating working two or three jobs. Some Christians who remarry discover they are not welcome in the church they loved. Others attend church but do so as second-class citizens, unable to become full members or take part in certain aspects of the life at church. That really hit me square in the eye several years ago when I had an elder 
uh, at my former, one of my former congregations. And he said, I never thought I'd be an elder. I go, why, Mike? He said, well, I'm divorced. I never thought I'd be a day when I could be an elder in a congregation. One of my best elders and still one of my best friends. Um, some feel driven away from Christianity entirely because of their divorces. So there's no question that Jesus said what he said about divorce and remarriage. But who was he speaking to, and what was he telling them, and what does it mean for us today? Well, today's passage from the Gospel of Mark includes two seemingly unconnected incidences. One involving a question about divorce, and the other in which parents bring children to Jesus to have him bless them. What do they have in common? Perhaps both address vulnerable populations, women and children, who in that day had fewer legal protections than men. So in this first part, some Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now according to Mark, they asked the question to test Jesus. In other words, to trap him, try to make him say something wrong. And those asking the question weren't really interested in the issue of divorce so much as how to spin any answer that Jesus gave them and make him look bad. So by the way, the questioners were Pharisees. And to some Pharisees are automatically the bad guys. Not so. Some Pharisees in Jerusalem who lived close to the center of money and power may have had bad motivations. But for the most part... The Pharisees were keepers of the word who served the ordinary believers as rabbis in the synagogues, and they looked after the spiritual needs of their flock. So as Jesus sometimes did to forestall a trap, he answered their question with a question. What did Moses command you? And the response gets to the heart of this matter, a matter of misinterpretation. They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. So Moses was the term used for the Torah, the commandments, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis through Deuteronomy. We're studying Genesis in adult Bible class. Come and learn more today. And starting with those ten commandments, guess how many commandments they got to after that? They added a few more. 612. Whew. He thought ten were hard. You know, 612 laws in those books of the Bible. And some, like the aforementioned 10, are foundational. And some expand on the 10, and some are what are known as case law, written to address specific cases and not necessarily every instance. So what was Moses addressing in that statement? In Deuteronomy it says, Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman, but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And I've always teased over the year, if she burns supper, she could get a divorce certificate. So he writes her certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. She then leaves his house and goes off to become another man's wife. Now that sounds pretty straightforward, right? Doesn't it? It's all cut and dried. Please the man. Or get out. Good work if you can get it. And indeed, there are some men who would use this law to become tyrants in their homes with a biblical warrant for their actions. But the devil, as is so true so often, is in the details. First of all, there's that word objectionable. One translation reads, he finds in her some shamefully expressed thing. The New Jewish Publication Society translation says, he finds something obnoxious about his spouse. Another commentator reads, because he finds in her a naked thing. So what seems to be implied is public lewd activity, not some question of whether dinner is served at 5.05 instead of 5 o'clock, or whether she burned supper or not. The Deuteronomy passage is an item of case law designed to address a specific problem and not meant to be used universally or literally for all marriages. And the text assumes 
that it is normal and natural for the woman to remarry. So Jesus knew the scriptures better than they did. And he knew that they were quoting this so far out of context, they might as well have been operating from another religion's book altogether. So let me say it again. The passage assumes that the wife will marry another. She is not barred from further marriage. Moreover, moreover, there are additional words in this passage that directly address abuse by men. Then suppose a second man dislikes her, writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or the second man who married her dies. Her first husband, who sent her away, is not permitted to take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that would be abhorrent to the Lord, and you shall not bring guilt on the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession. In other words, a men cannot divorce and remarry their spouses as a way of swapping wives, nor as a way of draft, draw, draft dodging. Now you're going, what? Draft dodging? What does that mean? Well, let's read the next verse. When a new man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be charged with any related duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with the wife whom he has married. Now, some would think that's kind of an old-fashioned way of saying, stay at home, take care of your wife, get your marriage started. It's still applied in our own church body back in the 1930s. My grandfather, when he was attending seminary, if someone found out, if the seminary found out that you were engaged, would tell that young man to leave the seminary, get married, and when you've been married a year, come back and finish your education. In my time... It, was, it actually went the other way. I had friends that would get divorced or uh, have experienced a DUI while they were in a seminary. Seminary would say, why don't you take a year off? Get your life together, and when you got things figured out, come on back. So it's still something that's applied. It's still a principle applied. Now, in this case, they're using it as a way of getting out of going to war, you know? In other words, if you don't marry a woman, you... You get a free year, if, when you do marry, you get a free year off of military service. Swap wives, and so you get another year's exemption. And then remarry your first spouse, so then you get another free pass. You know, go back and forth, and you, know, you don't have to go, by that time, maybe the war is over. You won't have to go at all. The fact is, though, though divorce was never a desirable outcome. You notice Jesus' words? Remember at the beginning, you know, and this is actually two to three times that the, the, the theology of marriage is actually mentioned in the Bible. We had our Old Testament lesson talking about it's not good for man to be alone, create Eve. Uh, and I said, if man should leave his father and mother, can't live in your basement forever of your parents' house. You have to go and get married. That's marriage ceremony, then you become one flesh. That's the honeymoon. That's God's order. That's God's plan for marriage. Mentioned again by Jesus here and also in Ephesians 5. That's God's plan for marriage. So divorce was never the... the Desirable outcome. God wants every marriage to survive. Um, I know my dad in his ministry, uh, and even advised me, he said, never, I never counseled a couple for divorce, but sometimes that was the best action to be taken. So when you've done everything you can and have exhausted everything, and I've said that to other, several people, including some of my own family members, make sure you've done everything you can to save your marriage. So that way, if it does end up in divorce, you said, I've tried everything I can. And again, thing to remember is, there is forgiveness. Can I repeat that again? Divorce is not an unforgivable sin. There is forgiveness for everything. And just fact, I just had a, a, a member ask that. You know, if I were to get divorced, would that, would, would that be a sin? And of course, they have two cases here mentioned in the text about, Jesus says about adultery and desertion as being, you know, uh, quote, uh, scriptural divorces. But even other divorces, they, if they're not, quote, scriptural, are still forgiveness for that. Uh, I also heard to a new friend I was having dinner with for us recently, she's divorced, and she, she advised her new husband, there is no way we're ever getting divorced. First time was way too hard. So you better get used to being living with me, because we ain't going through that divorce thing, okay? And that was God's plan, one man, one woman for a whole lifetime. It says it right there in Genesis 2. It says the same thing in Mark 10. It says the same thing in Ephesians 5. 
And just as there's no mention of a wedding service in Hebrew scriptures, though certainly weddings took place, and next to nothing is said about how to get a divorce either, this is because in the case of both weddings and divorces, Jewish society already knew how to do both. And so since women were in a vulnerable position in first century Judea, Jesus created a case law of his own. Stop abusing women by misusing Deuteronomy. Instead, care for your spouse. Now we're probably all familiar with the second part of this passage. People bring children to Jesus to bless them. And when the disciples try to send them away, he responds by inviting the children to approach. He concludes his lesson by saying, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. There is so much to say about this passage. But today I want to emphasize just one thing. Children were a particularly vulnerable population at this time, susceptible to early death and of little monetary value until they were old enough to work in the fields or in the family craft. What Jesus, when Jesus says we need to become like little children, he is suggesting we ought to stop having a high opinion of ourselves, thinking we're God's gift to humanity, and to stop acting like dictators. Our value comes from God's eyes. And fortunately, God's eyes are the eyes of love. Jesus himself is a model of how this should be. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, remember her? Divorced five times and living with the sixth guy. And Jesus thought her worthy of having a conversation and spent time with her. He thought she could be a, a person that could make an impact on her community. And that's what she did. She heard about this guy, Jesus, telling her how much he loves her and how much she's forgiven. And what'd she do? She told all her friends, Hey, meet a guy that told me everything I've done. Well, who doesn't know what you've done, lady? The whole town knows. We've been talking about you for years. But she was the one that Jesus talked to and saw her as someone who could hold up her end of a complex dialogue, an outcast who had potential to evangelize her whole village. So no one should go into a marriage thinking, at the first sign of trouble, I'm bailing on this guy, or girl, whatever the case may be, right? First sign of trouble. Love is a decision. Let me say it again. Love is a decision. You decide to get married. Uh, said many, many times, my wife and I have gone back and forth in this. I love you, dear, but I don't like you a lot right now. Right? We go through those moments in our marriage. But love is a decision saying, I will, marry, I will stay married to you no matter what, because the devil's not getting any part of this house. That takes work. That takes trust, that takes faith, that takes help. Trusting God, turning to God, using all the resources available, whether it be marriage encounter or weekend to remember or counseling or just having good friends that help support you in your marriage. All those things are important. Uh, we're not bailing at the first sign of trouble. However, there are abusers and users, tyrants and the damned who want to drag others into their damnation. And most of all, if we believe in death and resurrection, then the death of divorce should lead to hope and new life. So rather than using these verses as case law composed by Jesus to combat the misuse of a case law from the Hebrew Scriptures, how much better it is to offer grace, hope, and love to the vulnerable in our midst. That's what I call gospel. That's what I call good news. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> now may the peace of God pass his all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our worship as we sing the offertory that begins on page 192.
seated. Normally at this time we collect the offerings. Thank you for dropping off your offerings at the back of church there. You can do it on the way out as well. A uh, few exciting things happening today. Uh, one is the Leap uh, Fall Festival from 11 to 1. Hope you can come by. Great food, great pumpkins. And uh, we also uh, are blessed this afternoon to be able to pray in a special way for it at the Life Chain on Douglas. Meet at 1.30 there at north, north, northeast corner of, no, northwest corner of, what street is that? Fourth and Douglas. Okay, question or comment, please, Jessica. Next Sunday, right after church, well, not right after church, at 11, the youth are going to have a potluck in the basement, and then we're going to do our annual pumpkin decorating carving contest, so be thinking about what you want to do to your pumpkin, and then we're going to go to the park for some pickleball. All right. And they are awesome pumpkins. I always, this is my favorite time of year, seeing what the kids do to the pumpkins. Uh, last week at the voters meeting, I handed out, I sing bass today, uh, <laughs> handed out the stewardship. Those of you who are in a group, that would be elders or any group, we stewardship needs uh, your budget for the year. So that would include all of you. So there was a form I passed out, and if you can't find that, po that form, I don't know where they could find one. Maybe the office might yeah, have another we'll copy. One. We'll find one for them. Okay, so ask pastor whatever. We need to get those so stewardship can do their job. Okay, put together the budget. So pray for that process uh, this year as well. So thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> uh, any other announcement? I mentioned earlier the events for the week that are taking place. Um, as I mentioned also next Saturday... At 3 o'clock, Pastor Scott will be installed. His father will be the preacher. Uh, District President uh, Rich Snow will be here, the installer. And uh, we're very excited. He'll be arriving here with his wife for with, uh, minimal of things. Uh, as he hopes, I think, to have a bed and a folding table to get through the next few weeks before he moves his wife and the rest of his uh, possessions the first week of November. So pray for them. I talked, I've talked to him several times in the last week. There's a lot of details in moving and so forth. Um, he, uh, and I know the days will be a big day for them as they have a farewell. Uh, your first call is like your first love, right? And what's the song say? First cut is deepest. Um, you know, so uh, that's what's happening uh, for them today. So pray for them as they say farewell. But he also mentioned that he got to have some counsel with uh, brother pastors in his circuit. And uh, as they had their meeting this last week, and he got to say farewell to them. And he said, the one pastor said, you know, it's kind of like having your two feet in two, having your feet in two places. You know, he's finishing up in Rochester, Minnesota, but he's got a foot, and his heart is leaning towards O'Neill, Nebraska. So uh, that helps him get through a tough day like today, knowing that he has us here waiting for him to receive him and love him, and his wife Katie as they come to serve us uh, as associate pastor and wife uh, here in O'Neill. So we're very excited about it. So pray for them. Today's a special day. Next Saturday. Again, no Husker football game. Should be no reason unless you have a wedding to go to uh, that you can't be there. And um, we'll look forward to installing him and then having him in worship on Sunday. And uh, a couple of things next Sunday in terms of offerings, door offerings. Next week is the LDML door offering. Next week is also the end of the beginnings baby bottle fundraiser as well. Anything I forgot to remember? Good. Um... Let's continue our worship then with the prayers of church. I invite you to please stand as the offerings are brought forward. <clears throat> our prayer response this morning is, hear our prayer. Thank you. Lord, bless and use these gifts to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to your needs. Loving Father, your Son took the little children into his arms and blessed them. Help your saints to welcome little ones with joy, that nothing may hinder their entrance into the kingdom of God and the arms of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you give us men to guide your church on earth. We ask your blessing for Matthew, our synod president, Richard, our district president, and Leif, our circuit visitor and all pastors together 
with the many servants and treasures of your church. Lord, in your mercy, Lord God, be near all couples struggling in their marriages. Guard them from hardness of heart that would separate what you have joined together and reconcile them to one another to live in Christ's forgiveness and love. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, be near to families torn apart by adultery and divorce. Sustain and heal the wounded with your love. Give repentance to the guilty and hope in your forgiveness in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, grant your wisdom to Joseph, our president, to all public servants, and to those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, that they may be strengthened and upheld in every good deed. Lord, in your mercy, gracious God, you promise to abide with your people and uphold them in their suffering. Comfort all who are sick and sorrowing. We especially, Lord, lift up to you Sidney Carlson, Kevin Lichty, who's recovering from shoulder surgery, Howard Quant, as he recovers at home, Randy Spreckles. Thank you, Lord, the Fleming's granddaughters are home in Crofton. We ask your healing upon Vonda Bentz, who had back surgery. Be with Liz Spicer, Earl Strong, Wynn Johnson, Bill Krugman, Janice Peterson. We also, Lord, pray for all those who battle cancer. Be with Lauren Hoffer. Thank you that PJ Gian Maria is done with his treatments. Grant Jolene Lichty your healing hand and relieve her of pain as she's hospitalized. Be with Jack Hoffman, Barb Weeding, Rachel Coloff, Connie Pruitt. Thank you that Pastor Brad Bertell is back preaching. Grant him strength in his legs to serve your people. Be with Beth Martinson, Carolyn Stewart, Alan Bentz, Elaine Nelson, Helen Taylor, Tom Sanders, Fred Ships, and Patrick Salon. We ask you, Lord, strengthen their faith in the midst of their trials. Grant them health and healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, we'll ask you, Lord, to bless those who have birthdays in our parish. We ask your blessings upon Amanda Kramer, Wyatt Drukey, Chantel Peter, Tyler Brandt, Luke Wilson, Theo Parks, Daniel Nicolite, Michaela Jenkins, Sherry Oftenkamp, Jody Fox, and Mary Miller. Bless these your servants with special days of celebration. Your bless your love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of love, we ask you bless all families and marriages, especially those who celebrate their anniversaries made to you and each other. We ask your blessings upon Dan Jr. and Deborah Nicolite, Rob and Brittany Sudbeck, and Mark and Wendy Fowler. May they grow more in love with you and each other. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, your Son gives us his very body and blood to eat and drink in the supper. Grant us your grace that we may approach your table with repentant hearts and a firm resolution to amend our sinful lives by the help of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, help us by your Spirit to fear you and walk in your ways in Christ that we may eat the fruit of the, of the labor of our hands and receive your blessing in all that we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy, same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the service of the sacrament, begin with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary. Shall all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
come is your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, same night as we trade, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to disciples, and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The same way also took the cup after supper, and when he gave given thanks, he gave it to him, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
page 199. unto the Lord for he is good we give thanks to you almighty God that you refresh us through this beneficial gift and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ your son our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord says shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. for a closing hymn, hymn number 862, O oh, Bless the House.